That sounds wacky when you just It's wacky, it. right? So practical application is if you say if yourself or your listeners, you know, take the challenge to wear like a continuous glucose monitor for 14 days or whatever it is, you put that on and then you start to quickly see that if you eat a slice of cake at 8 a.m. and you eat the same slice of cake at 8 p.m., that the body tends to elicit a higher glucose response in the evening versus the morning. So meaning that there is this kind of circadian nature to even our ability to, to process or to, for the glucose levels to stay stabilized later on in the evening. And if we think about it, all of the things that I'm doing with sleep as a skill is really hearkening back to like hunter-gatherer days in a lot of ways. And if you think about hunter-gatherer days, certainly we wouldn't have most likely been eating much past sunset because would we have been able to have refrigeration processes? No. Would we have been able to go hunting and pitch black? Unlikely. All these things we wouldn't be eating in the same way we are now, really post-sunset. And if you think about it, I mean, certainly for me, again, to use myself as an example, for years I was living like a bat or something and <laughs> upside down. Right. I was pretty much, you know, going to bed late, you know, eating late, watching whatever, popcorn with Netflix and wine or something. And all of those things send a confusing signal from a circadian perspective to our body and our health. But on a glucose level, it's leading itself to look at a couple of things around uh, some of the benefits of circadian rhythm intermittent fasting, which is like a fancy series of words to really just denote like looking at eating between sunrise and sunset and some of the benefits of that. And then a more kind of like, not extreme, but a uh, strong, longer fast of early time restricted eating. And so that you're ending uh, your meals around like two or 3 PM or so. I mean, of course, depending on your bedtime and wake time and what have you. And so I practice a little bit in between the two of those for the most part. So ending my meals early, and then we see the glucose benefits that can come from that. And so if you're measuring with those continuous glucose monitors, you can start to see that. And how that relates with sleep, of course, is that one of the top things that we look at if people are having complaining of a lot of frequent wake-ups, you know, there's a number of reasons that could be at the source point of frequent wake-ups. But barring, say, like, you know, some sort of clear physiological ailment, what have you, from a behavioral standpoint, the instability of blood sugar throughout the course of the night can really cause those frequent wake-ups and also the type of wake-ups that have you up that are like the annoying type of wake-ups where, and the reason for that is when you have that stark drop in glucose, then the body kind of freaks out momentarily, then releases cortisol and adrenaline. And so of course, cortisol and adrenaline are kind of the antithesis of what we want while we're, you know, in the middle of a sleep period. And so that can be those type of wake-ups where you're just like, why am I like wide awake at four in the morning or whatever it is? And, and why is that? If it's in that area of the blood sugar concern, then that's relating to some of those drops in glucose. Um, and sometimes it okay. can also be difficulty with sleep latency. Say if you have elevated blood sugar before going to bed, and often that can actually have a like kind of thermal regulation effect and your body temperature is really important to sleep quality and quantity. And so if your body temperature is going up when you're aiming to go to bed, that can be those are counter signs to the body of the normal function that we would have in order to get ourselves sleepy. So that can impact our sleep latency numbers and just make it harder to fall asleep, basically. 